Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my too till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my too till I met you. When you called my know Jesus, this is your story and this is my story. Sing this out with me. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break out the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love the air that I'm breathing I have a future my eyes are open cause when you call my name shout out church I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name glorious day. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're so excited to be here this morning. We're excited to continue to worship and remember that all that God has done for us, remember all the things um, that as we have walked through even difficult times, that we can focus on Him, that we can focus on all the promises that He's made to us. My heart hangs on every word that you speak. I need you, Lord, come find me. Holy Spirit, breathe. I've been Walking through deserts, I need more of your presence. I'm weak, Savior, be my strength. Down in the valley, when waters rise, I'm still believing. Hope is alive. All through the struggle.
done all of hell is overcome Jesus shout a victory song, you church. are alive let me hear you shout a victory song hallelujah death is done all of hell is overcome oh my Jesus you are be seated this morning. take it home and then put it somewhere obviously like our family they're going to get play with it at some point but <laughs> you can put it somewhere that when you think about our veterans you think those who have served and think of those who are serving right now just pray for them and this is a good way to keep it in our forefront so make sure you grab one when you walk out the door today we are so thankful for all our veterans today thank you so much 
And thank you all for being here today. This is, this is a great day. We're so happy that you're here. Um, Morning Star Baptist Church is a place that you're not just welcome, but you're wanted. And, and we're glad that you chose to come and hang out with us today. And when you came in, everybody should have received a packet. And in that packet was a connection card. Go ahead and pull it out right now. Um, and you can go ahead and start filling that out. Uh, it doesn't bother me because nobody pays attention to announcements anyway. But you can go ahead and fill this out. If this is your first time here, we're going to ask you to fill out as much information as you feel comfortable putting on here. I'm not going to show up at your house. I promise I'm not going to stalk you, but I, I would love to mail you a gift card as our way of saying thank you for being with us today. And it makes it a lot easier if I have your address. It, chasing down phone books really is hard to do. So, But if you can fill it out, and you can just drop that in the offering plate when it comes by here in a little bit. And uh, we'd love to just say thank you for being here. And for our members and our regular attenders, we ask you at least put your name and email address on there. So we can keep you up to date with everything going on in our church because there's so much happening at Morningstar Baptist Church. And we will make sure you have the information because there's nothing worse than somebody saying, I didn't know about that. So it's either in the bulletin or you're going to email about it. So make sure you pull that, fill it out. And on the back is a place for your next steps. Maybe you've been coming for a while. And yeah, it's, it's time for me to go ahead and just join the church. I want to be part of that family. You can put on there. Um, I'll become a member and we'll get you information about our next new members class. Maybe you need to get baptized. We actually have five lined up to get baptized here in the next several weeks, so you won't be alone. So you find there all to get baptized, and we'll reach out to you this week and get you that information. Or maybe you just have a prayer request. You can put that on the bottom, because the men of our church, we meet together every Tuesday morning, and we just pour over these and lay them at the feet of Jesus every Tuesday morning, praying for whatever you put on here. And it's awesome to know that you have people coming alongside you and praying with you and for you, and that you're not alone. So you can put that on there and rest assured we're going to pray for you this week and whatever you put on there. Uh, we do have a lot going on in our church. Uh, today, after the service, we have two different, two different things going on. One, we have our first annual chili cook-off, and a lot of people have brought chili, and we have the golden ladle um, as a prize for that and gift cards for first, second, and third. You can't cheat, so don't go to land and try to give them money or anything like that. It's not going to work. <laughs> Because I already got, I'm just kidding, I didn't make any chili. So, but it's going to be awesome. It's going to be right out in the lobby afterwards. So there, it's not going to be like we're going to feed everybody the chili, but you might be able to sneak some taste of chili after the contest. And so that's going on today afterwards, as well as our men's flag football game going on in the field. We painted it like a football field. We even have a referee. Mike's going to take care of that. So don't give him money either for good calls or bad calls. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, it, you know how flag football starts off flag, turns into tackle. We're going to do our best not to let that happen, but I can't control everything. You know what I'm saying? So, um, or Ben. But if you want to see me vomit, that's going to happen too because I'm super out of shape. It's going to be fun. Uh, you can come and watch. Uh, it's for a youth group and up uh, age uh, men of our church. And so we're just going to have a good time playing for about an hour after church today. Next Sunday is our Thanksgiving meal. And so we, we're providing the turkey, the stuffing, the macaroni and cheese, uh, the dressing, the rolls, the ham. Mike's got feeding me words here. Like We'll provide the drinks, all that. All we ask you to do is bring two dishes. It can be two sides or two desserts or one of both. Now here's the deal. My favorite is green bean casserole. Even though I heard this week that green bean casserole wakes up ranks on the lowest of the favorites of Thanksgiving meals, people aren't right with God. I don't know what, we're gonna start a revival in our land and people are gonna get that. So, and then that is pecan pie. Everybody can't bring green bean casserole and pecan pie, but I'll bring all those leftovers home, so don't feel bad, all right? So, one of, the, one of these, bring both, but we're gonna provide everything else. This place is gonna be packed last year. We had overflow people, it was amazing. It's next Sunday night at five o'clock. So you can just bring your dishes ahead of time, get them to Mike, they'll set them out, him and Karen set all that out. And we're just looking forward to a great time of fellowship, hanging out and eating, which is what Baptists do. And uh, so it's a good time, all right? Uh, the other thing going on is Operation Christmas Child is also in the lobby and Karen's been manning that table. So make sure you stop by and get some information on how we can be a blessing to kids around the world uh, at Christmas time. Last announcement, tonight from 6.30 to 8 p.m., parents, Key in, all right? This is a free night for you because you get to drop your kids off for play practice tonight. An hour and a half of free babysitting while they work on their play, but you gotta bring your kids because that play is like three weeks, four weeks away. So we're very close. We need the kids here to be able to go on stage and work through lines and all that kind of stuff for our Christmas program. So drop them off. Um, not nursery age kids. It's only the kids that are in the program. Like, we're not watching everybody. I, I'm sitting in the men's house. It's okay. So, but tonight from 6.30 to 8. And you have to come pick up your kids. All right? You can't. 
leave them, all right? We, we've been through that, all right? So we love them, but we're not staying all night. So anyway, so that's everything going on in church that I know of right now. I probably missed something, but check your emails and our social media. But our ushers would come forward this time. We're going to receive the offering today. And for our guests, we ask you to just turn in your connection card during this time. We don't ask you to give any money. We just want to... Just rejoice that you're here and celebrate you and, and send you a gift as our way of saying thank you. And for the rest of us, it's our way of giving back. Because we're trying to reach this community of Centerville, Ohio, this area of Southwest Ohio, our nation and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what we're able to give back to God helps us do that. And so we're just, man, it's, it's a time of worship. We get, man, what an amazing opportunity to give back to God, and especially seeing what all he's doing in our church right now and in our area. And through our missions program. Man, what a great time to be a part of our church. What a great time to be a part of what God's doing right now. And so we're gonna give him this time this morning. So let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this opportunity this morning to come and to worship you in our song, worship, worship you in our giving, worship you just in our fellowship, just hanging out. And God, we just pray that through all this today, that you are lifted up, that it's all about you. Thank you for everybody that's here today. God, thank you for our veterans that just gave of their lives to, to set aside everything they wanted to do to serve their country and to help preserve this freedom that we have. We can never say thank you enough. God, I hope today that we will honor them. And today, God, I pray that you are glorified. Glorified because of all of our sacrifice. Glorified because of our worship today. Glorified because it's all about you. Use us to reach this area with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Use, use, use us to reach one more person here and around the world, to invite them to be a part of your table, to invite them to be a part of your kingdom. For your glory, God, be with the rest of our service today.
You know, this, this next song that we're going to sing, we introduced last week, and, and it starts off and it says, the, west, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When darkness falls, it won't prevail. You know, sometimes we walk through situations and difficulties in life, and we see the weapon being formed, and it seems like everything's falling apart. And we see the, the, the darkness fall. But it goes on to say there's power in the mighty name of Jesus. And it goes on to say that the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And it's just something I want you to, as we sing this song again this week, because I really want you to get it. I really want you to, to hear it. I want this to be the anthem of your heart as you walk through difficult moments, as you walk through difficult times. That the God that you serve the God that you follow, the God that you claim. He's never failed. He's never lost. He only knows triumph. And so as we sing this song, let's rest in what it speaks about our God and let's rest in what it says about our position if we know him as our Savior. Formed, but it won't prosper when darkness falls it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph my God will never fail oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There is power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he
Father, Lord, we praise you in this place. Lord, we praise you for who you are. We praise you that you are good. We praise you that you are victorious. Lord, we, we praise you because we could stand here knowing how the story ends and from the victory we can sing and we can shout and we can worship no matter what the circumstance around us holds because it's all about you and the victory we're going to see is your victory and no matter what our life holds no matter what we walk through that you're working it all together for your honor and for your glory we ask that you would help us to make you famous and to lift your name high Lord we love you and praise you and it's in your name we pray amen thank you church you can be seated second week of our series we're calling At the Table, and, and uh, so we've got our Thanksgiving table set up, and if you really want to mess with Ben, he's been watching way too many episodes of Downton Abbey, he like measured all this stuff out, so if you want to mess with him, like move stuff around up here, it's really funny. Anyway, um, we're talking about celebrating the goodness of God, and last week I was like, man, we're talking about this Thanksgiving table, what I need is a big old drumstick to like preach and hold and point at people and sling grease at people, and I didn't get a drumstick, but Becky brought me a Cornish game hen. It's got a small one, right? So I can like, hey, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, it's actually fresh baked this morning, but I'll, I'll pass right now. But anyway, so I do have my drumstick. So that's awesome. Thanks, Becky, for doing that. It's amazing. But hey, we're looking at celebrating the goodness of God. And last week, we unpacked this idea of celebrating the goodness of God and our salvation, the fact that we have eternal life. Um, that God is good and he does what is good. And like when we stop and look at, at our resume compared to his resume, and we, we stop and actually realize who he is and what he's done compared to who we are and what we've done, it should really shock us a bit. That we stand in that awe, that, that, that awesome fear of God and say, wow. Like that really means something. It should usher us into this, this attitude of thankfulness to celebrate who God is instead of, instead of what we do a lot is celebrate who we are. We need to look at who he is and like this whole thing is about celebrating the goodness of God. And this week we're gonna talk about celebrating the goodness of God in the valley. So last week we were here, so join me again in Psalm 23. Is where we're gonna be. If you don't have your Bible, we'll have it up on the screen. But the 23rd Psalm was written by David and, and I, I kind of joked last week, but it really is true that this Psalm really becomes cliche. Because if you watch any Hollywood film, if you watch any TV show where there's a funeral, it's like this is the only Bible passage those pastors know. And so they read or quote the 23rd Psalm. And, but there's so much more here. It's actually a celebration of the goodness of God. So join me in the 23rd Psalm. Here's what David says. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
man, when you start to unpack that a little bit and actually get down to what David is talking about, it's, it's a lot deeper than just reading at a funeral. And, and I, got, I got some really shocking news for you this morning, okay? So this is going to blow you away. You might not have ever heard it before. Like, I'm totally going to drop a truth bomb on you today, so get ready. You might want to write it down. Some of you actually take notes. Some of you sleep. Those of you who take notes, like, you might want to write it down. I'm getting ready. I'm giving you warning, all right? So here it is, all right? And it's only three words. And it's going to rock your world this morning. Life is hard, okay? <laughs> Life is tough. It's hard. It, it's difficult. I mean, I know. It's like, okay, we've heard that before. Here's the deal. Remember when you were a teenager, okay? Go back with me. Some of you further back than others, all right? Um, I'm not going to mention names, but like go back to me when you were a teenager. And you remember like when you had life all figured out? <laughs> like you knew all the answers. And you looked at your parents and said, man, surely life isn't that tough. Surely like... If, if my parents who are idiots can do this, surely I, who know everything, can get through this with no problem. You guys remember that? Anybody kind of, maybe I'm the only one who thought that way when I was 17, maybe. But you had it all figured out. You're like, man, life is going to be so easy. I got this. This is going to be so easy. And then you move out. And you can start this new life on your own. And you're so excited. Maybe you got your own apartment. Maybe you went off to college. Like, you're away from mom and dad. And you're like, this is so cool. I got this. And then your car breaks down. <laughs> and then you need to put gas in the car but you spend all your money that you're gonna spend on gas fixing your car. And then you need some money to go buy the ramen noodles at the store because that's all you can afford to eat anyway. And you're sitting in your, in your apartment wondering, okay, how am I gonna get through this? And then you get the mail. And there's this nice little letter and you open it up and it says minimum payment due on your credit card that was so easy to use, right? Like, you just swipe it and forget it, and it's so awesome, and then this thing comes out. And you're like, man, um, this all of a sudden got real. Or maybe for you it was something like this. Maybe you moved out and you met that, that girl or guy of your dreams, and for guys, like, you, you, you get married, and you get your own little place, and you're making life together. Like, you're, you're working like dogs to make ends meet. You're eating macaroni and cheese at every meal. Like, you, you don't go anywhere if you can't afford to go anywhere. Your night of amazingness is watching TV. But it's so awesome because you're living the dream. And all of a sudden, your wife gets sick. And you're thinking, that's no big deal, but then the sickness doesn't go away. And so a week and a half later, you take her to the doctor and say, Doctor, you got to help her. Like, she, she's sick, like, every day, and I don't know what to do. And I don't know if it's the flu or what. And the doctor runs some tests, and he comes back in the room with a great big smile on his face and pats you on the back and says, well, it's not the flu, but it'll be over in nine months. Congratulations, Daddy. And you're like, what? <laughs> that happened to us. <laughs> we were living in Iowa, and Mandy got sick, and like, she couldn't stop getting ill. And we took her to the doctor, and it was like some bad case of the stomach bug. And he walks in all happy and chipper and says, hey, congratulations, you're pregnant. <laughs> no. <laughs> And after I punched him in the nose, like, we paid the doctor bill, like, no, this can't be. But it was like, you, and you're like, okay, how am I going to do this? I'm going to support a family? I, I, we can't even sort of support ourselves, and now we're down to one income? Because my wife's got to stay home? Like, how, how's this going to happen? Life got tough. And then you get to the point where you, you long for the days to have the problems you used to have, right? When you get to be in your 30s, you just wish for the days you were in your 20s and had those kind of problems. Like, oh man, that was nothing. And then you get in your 40s and you just wish for the good old days of your 30s when those were the only problems that you had and this cycle repeats itself over and over again. And then all of a sudden the major things happen. Like cancer hits. Jobs get lost. Kids get hurt or get sick. Loved ones die. Enemies start to creep in. Like things get said about you. You get stabbed in the back. People you never thought would hurt you all of a sudden become some of the people who hurt you the most. And then stress takes over. The days get long. The nights get longer. Happiness is just something they make movies about and TV shows about because you can't even remember the last time you really laughed. You know the enemy can't steal your joy, but you're having a really hard time finding it these days. Stuff happens that's beyond your control. It's not your fault. You didn't ask for it, you didn't plan for it, you didn't do anything to cause it, but it happens anyway. Then stuff happens because of things you did do. You look at your life and you're honest, and yeah, I'm here because of something I did, I said, it's totally my fault. We don't like to admit that, but like we just, if we're honest with ourselves, like that's why we're in that situation. 
But there's three real quick truths, and I'm going to fly through these because I want to get to our passage. But the three truths about life that we need to know is one, life is hard. Two, life hurts. And when number one is true and number two is true, hope gets really hard to find. One, life is hard, life hurts. And number three, rule number three about life is when one and two are true, hope gets really hard to find. It doesn't come as easy anymore. But we're talking about celebrating the goodness of God. And you're like, John, get to the goodness part. Like, that's why we're, we're here. But remember, last week we said God is good and God does what is good. We found out in Psalm 78 that God is good. It's who he is. It's his nature. It's, it's all about him. But not just is he good, but he does what is good. It doesn't mean that only good things are ever going to happen to us. What it means is what David tells us in the 23rd Psalm, that his goodness will follow us all the days of our life. Remember, God originally created this world good. Like, it was perfect. It was awesome. It was amazing. He didn't want death. He didn't want suffering. He didn't want cancer. He didn't want pain, heartache, loss. He didn't want friends to leave you. He didn't want sin. That was not part of his picture. That's our fault. We did that. But in the middle of this journey, even in the middle of all this suffering and heartache and pain, God is still good and he still does what's good. Look in Psalm 23 again. Look in verse 4 and 5. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. I want to pull some things out of here that, that if you just read it or quote it, that when it becomes cliche, we can totally miss. So I want you to walk down this journey with me this morning as we look at this psalm, especially these two verses and look at this, look in verse 4 again. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Number one, valleys are a reality. Valleys are a reality. The, the phrase in, in, in the translation says, even though I walk. Even though I walk. Now the Hebrew phrasing there, it doesn't say, it doesn't use a, a happenstance tense of that phrase. It doesn't say, should I happen to walk? Or if I happen to find myself in a valley, the, the word, we use four words to say it, but it's actually in, in Hebrew, it's yalak. Yalak, and it just one word, and it says, when I walk. The Hebrew that we use four words for is one word, and when we translate it, it's when I walk, which means valleys are a reality. It's not just if I'm going to go through a valley. It's not just, hey, maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll have some hard times. It's when I'm there. When I'm in the valley. And what makes it really hard for us is this, is nobody shows the valley that you're in. We don't do it, which is actually, you know, there's time and place for that. But here's what really hurts. We're all part of social media. We, you know, we have Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and, and, and Snapchat and all these things. And what you don't see is people taking pictures of themselves and like, or posting about the depths of their valley all the time. And so we get on our social media and we see everybody happy. They're at Disney World or they're on a date with their spouse or their kids are all well-behaved and smiling even though it took an hour and a half to get them that way, right? We don't see that because nobody posts the valley. We only post the good things. And so we look at these people and we're like, man, they have it all together. Nothing bad ever happens to them. Nothing, like their whole life is perfect. I wish me and my spouse got along like they get along. I wish my kids behave like their kids. I wish we could go to Disney World every year like they go to Disney World every year. And so we see people at their best and we forget that, guess what? They're going through valleys too. And so we start to think we're the only ones in a valley. But valleys are a reality for everyone. Because David says, when I walk through the valley. Second thing, valleys are reality, number one. Number two, valleys are rough. Look at verse four again. Even though through, I walk through the valley. Now, he doesn't just say, I walk through the valley and then go on from there. He gives the valley a name. And it isn't clouds and rainbow valley, okay? It, it, it isn't puppy dog and Labrador kisses valley. It's the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> I don't think we can get any more descriptive than that, do you? Like, I think David kind of hits it right on the head. Like, he didn't say what a lovely canyon this is with some really cool rocks. And, yes, yeah, things to not be in the, in the sun and be in the shade all the time. But, you know, overall, it was lovely. That's not what he says. He didn't say, hey, even though I walk and I have to cross over this ditch, it's really kind of a stretch for me, but, hey, I did it. That's not what he says. He says, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
It's a shadow of death. I mean, I, it's fearful. The shadow having this idea of there's, there's no light, which means it's hard to find a hope. It's hard to see a way out. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel because you can't even see the end of the tunnel. All you see is darkness and gloom and you don't know how to get out. You're hoping and begging for a way out, but you're in the valley of the shadow of death. It's like no matter where you turn, it, whatever you're going through follows you. That's the idea. It's there. It's frustrating. It's unknown. It's lonely. It's intimidating because the valleys are rough. And I think if we're going to be honest this morning and we start talking about our valleys with one another, I think as we share the valleys that we're in, we're like, yeah, it's rough. We can understand why David calls it the shadow of death. Because sometimes in the valleys, we feel like part of us has died. Like, man, there's no way out. It's hurt so bad. I don't know how to overcome this. Because valleys are reality, valleys are rough. The third thing is this. We see that valleys are rooted in two causes. So valleys are reality, valleys are rough, valleys are rooted in two causes. The first cause is this, we're in a valley due to nothing of our own doing. Like absolutely beyond our control, just because we live in a fallen, broken world with fallen, broken people, we're going to end up in a valley. Like we can't do anything about that. David fought a number of battles in valleys that he had no cause in. He just found himself in the valley. You remember when he was running from Saul? He spent a lot of his times in valleys and canyons, hiding out in caves, running from a guy trying to kill him when he didn't do anything. Like he's supposed to be king. He's been anointed to be king, but this guy Saul, who is king, hates him, wants to kill him, and so he's running and hiding. He didn't ask for those valleys. Year after year after year, living in a cave in a valley. He didn't cause that. But he ended up there. Then he found himself, before that, he found himself in the Valley of Elah. Later on, he found himself in the Valley of Rephaim. The Valley of Elah is where he fought Goliath. The Valley of Rephaim is where he fought the Philistines over and over again. But think about that Valley of Elah. Like he's a teenager, and he's just being obedient to his dad and bringing food to his brothers who are in the army. And David shows up in the Valley of Elah on the one side of the valley where, his, where the army's at. And he didn't ask for those two armies to be scurrying off in battle. He didn't ask for that. He's a teenager. He's a shepherd. He didn't ask for when he got here there to find the Israelite army, a bunch of cowards who didn't want to do anything. He didn't ask for that either. He didn't ask for the fact that when he got there, he found a king who was totally incompetent who doesn't want to do anything that might tarnish his reputation or might hurt him in any way. David didn't ask for that. All David was doing was being obedient, and he found himself in a valley facing the giant. You understand what I'm talking about when I say sometimes we end up in a valley simply because we're just being obedient to God. Simply just because we're following God, sometimes beyond our control. He just showed up and found himself facing a giant in the valley of decision through no fault of his own but just being obedient. That's the first cause of a valley. You have no, you, you didn't do anything about it. It was just, you're there. The second root cause of a valley is sometimes we find ourselves in a valley because of our own brokenness. Sometimes we find ourselves in a valley because of our own choices. David knew about this kind of valley too. He knew about the kind of valley that he could end up in when he strayed and made really horrible life decisions. Not too long after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband Uriah killed, a few years later, his son Absalom rose up and chased his dad off the throne. And once again, David found himself running through the same valleys that he was hiding from Saul in. But now he's running from his own son who wants to kill him and take the throne. David realized this one, this is on me. This is on me. Like I'm here because of my sin. I'm here because of what I have done. So when David is, is writing this psalm and he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he doesn't specify which type of valley he's in. He doesn't specify, he doesn't say this is a valley because I had nothing to do with it or even though I walked through the valley of, because I had something to do with it and I'm here because of my own sin and brokenness, he doesn't say because it doesn't matter. Get this, Here's why it doesn't matter, because a valley is a valley is a valley. When you're calling and the sh when you're walking and you're caught in the shadow of death and you're standing in the bottom and you're crying out for deliverance, you're crying out for some kind of relief, you're crying out for some kind of daylight, at that point it doesn't matter why you're there. 
You don't care why you're there. You just want out. You just want hope. You just want joy. You just want relief. And so David leaves this open on purpose for us because it doesn't matter what valley you find yourself in this morning. Some of us might be in a valley and we have no control over it. We're just there. Some of us might be in a valley because of choices and decisions we've made. Listen to me. It doesn't matter why you're there. We all want the same thing. David realized that he's like, I just want the same thing. It's the valley of the shadow of death. And David, what I love what David says, it says in the middle of the valley, he says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is good and God does what's good. Regardless of why you're in the valley this morning, God is good and he does what is good. You're like, but John, you have no idea what I've done. You're right, I don't. But I know God is good. And I know God does what is good. And David says, I'm not going to fear any evil because in the middle of the valley, look at it, you are with me. He says, you're with me. And where God is, he says, the goodness and mercy will follow me. Where God is, there is good there. Not that good things are going to happen. Not that it's good to be in the valley, but it's good to be in the valley with a good God. Does that make sense? He says, good is there. God is there. And by his very nature, God is good. But David gives us some insight into that valley. And I love this. This is amazing. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is huge. The word for rod is shavet. And it's translated as rod, indicating a rod of correction. And it's used that way 34 times in the Old Testament. Shavet, rod of correction. If we're in the valley because of our own doing, then God's rod of correction is a comfort. You're like, it doesn't feel like a comfort right now. But what it does is it displays the love of God and his work in sanctifying us and making us more like Christ. That he's working on us. He's molding us. He's still with us. He's not forsaking us and has not left us in the valley to rot. He is doing his good work of molding us into the image of his son. The rod of correction. Then he says, if we're in the valley and we have no control over being here, he says, then your staff, your rod, of, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The staff of protection is there to comfort us and it allows us to rest in him. The word for staff actually refers to the support staff, the staff that the shepherd carried, that the shepherd would use to lean on and rest and he also used to protect the flock from wolves and from predators. What I love is that no matter why we are in the valley, his rod of correction and his staff of protection are there for us all. Rod and staff, those two different words, refer to the same instrument. They both refer to the shepherd's staff. But God, through David, used the two words to describe the two different functions of that staff. That that staff can be used for correction, and that staff can be used for protection. That staff can be used for discipleship or discipline. That staff can also be used for us to lean on while we're in the valley to keep us from growing too weary. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, it doesn't mean that nothing physical, harmful is gonna ever come to us. What it means is I'm safe in my relationship with him no matter what, that my salvation is secure in God because the valley is reality, the valley is rough. The valley is rooted in two causes. The last thing is this, valleys and tables are connected. Look at verse five. He says, you prepare a place for me at the table in the presence of my enemies. This gets so impactful when we remember that sometimes we think God is only good in the good times. We think God is good when I'm not in the valley. God is good when things are going good and we forget that God is good and he does what's good no matter where we're at. This verse, though, verse 5, where he says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy, is connected to verse 4. And what it looks like is this, is even in the middle of the valley, even in the middle of the storm, even in the middle of others attacking us, even in the middle of our enemies surrounding us, there is that God is here and God prepares a table that, there, that others are trying to discourage us. And there's no mention of deliverance from the valley. 
It goes right from verse 4 to verse 5. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. There's no mention of out of the valley. But God is still there. And in the middle of the valley, God prepares a table for us. David says in the middle of the valley, in the middle of the attacks, right in the eye of the storm, God, you are good. What he's saying is my place at the table is secure. It's secure that no matter what happens, no matter what others say about me, no matter how many times I failed, no matter how many times I've been in the same valley, no matter how deep the valley, no matter what the sin is that put me in the valley, my place at his table is secure and prepared. And you've welcomed me. You've given me a spot. This is huge. This is, this is our hope in the darkest nights. This is where we go looking for our joy that is so hard to find in the middle of the valley. The fact that my place at God's table is secure. And I love this. He says, you anoint my head with oil. This is big coming from a guy who has committed adultery, committed murder, like a number of times did the exact opposite of what God told him to do because in the Old Testament, anointing someone's head with oil was a sign that the presence of God was upon them. So David writing this probably in the later years of his life, understanding, looking back over his life and all the valleys that he's been through, he says, you've anointed my head with oil, which is so big because what God is saying is I'm not done with you. No matter why you're in the valley, no matter how deep and dark the valley, no matter what sin has caused you to drift down in this valley, I'm anointing your head with oil in the presence of your enemies to show that I am not done with you, that I am with you. My presence is with you. He says, you anoint my head with oil. Then he says, he fills my cup. I'm in the valley. My enemies have gathered around. God says, I prepared a table for you. I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to show that I'm still with you, even though it hurts, even though it's dark, even though it's difficult. And I'm going to take your cup and I'm going to overflow it. It's in the valley that we are most aware of the presence of our enemies, isn't it? Somebody senses weakness or faults and failures and we pounce and our enemies, we're very aware of our enemies in the valley. And here's, I, I can set a table and I can say, hey, I want to prove that I'm okay and I got it all together. I don't want them to see this getting to me. I don't want them to see this bothering me. So I'm going to prepare this table and I'm going to set it. Or I can let God prepare a table for me. Now, who do you think sets a better table? Who do you think can do an amazing job in the presence of my enemies in the middle of the valley? Who can set the spread to send the message better, me or God? Absolutely, God, every time I can wait and trust in him. And he says, I'm going to anoint your head with oil in the presence of your enemies. It says, I'm not through with you. And my presence is with you. And I'm going to overfill your cup in the presence of your enemy. Not cup to say, I'm going to give you all kinds of good stuff. And the job you lost, you're going to get it back. And the stuff you lost, you're going to get it back. Not that. That's not the cup he's filling. He's filling our cup with that hope and joy that, remember, gets so hard to find in the valley when we recognize his goodness compared to our lack of goodness and we realize that our cup is just overflowing, that that's where I need to be looking for my hope and my joy. And God says, I'm going to give you abundance of that because it might be a while that you're here. It might be a short time that you're here. But God said, I'm not through with you. And I'm going to give you exactly what you need and more than enough of it. Not possessions, but grace. Why? Because God is good. And God does what is good. And then he says, surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because there's coming a day when there's no more valleys. There's coming a day where there's no more valley of the shadow of death, no more sorrow. One day there will be no more sin thrusting us into regret, shame, and sorrow. One day we'll be with the Lord forever and we will celebrate the goodness of God for eternity. Because we know how it ends. The keeper of us in the valley will raise us up to life everlasting. To be with him forever. He says, I prepare a table for you. 
We celebrate the goodness of God not because life is easy, but in spite of the fact that life isn't easy. We celebrate the goodness of God because of what he's done for us. We celebrate the goodness of God because even in the middle of our deepest, darkest, most painful and hurtful times, we can claim like David, you're with me. Regardless of why I'm here, you're with me. You're not through with me. And my source of hope and my source of joy, it might get hard to find, but if I just put my eyes back on you, I realize my cup is overflowing. God is good. Even in the valley, God is good. Church, let me have you bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment this morning. I think for some of us, it, you talk about valleys, we talk about hard times, we talk about difficult situations, and our mind immediately goes to whatever situation we're in, doesn't it? And all of a sudden, our valley becomes even more defined for us. We're reminded that we're in that place. We're reminded that we're in that place that we, we call the shadow of death. We call this, I, I have no hope, I have no, I have no direction, I have no idea when this is going to end, and we just cry out for relief. This morning, why don't we just cry out to God? God, you're with me in the valley. God, you're with me on the mountaintop. God, you're with me when it's going well. You're with me when it's not going well. You're with me in the pain. The problem is we start looking at us. We start trying to find our strength in us. We start trying to find our support in us, and we miss it because it's not there. We're just an empty cup. And then we work so hard to prepare a table to try to show everybody that we're okay and we got it all together. <laughs> Nothing to see here because we don't want our enemies to see that we're weak. We don't want our enemies to see that, that we've messed up. We don't want everybody else, maybe people who aren't even our enemies, to know that we're struggling. So we work so hard to prepare a table and God says, I already prepared it. <laughs> and it's amazing. And it's free. I paid for it for you like my this, the blood of my son set this amazing table, bought all of it. I got the food. I got the drink. I got the fellowship. I got the seat just for you. And as believers, sometimes we forget that. And we're over here trying to build our own table. Maybe for some of us this morning, we just need to come back to the table. Celebrating the goodness of God in the valley. How refreshing it is when we look at the rod and the staff of our Lord and quit fighting against it and just allow him to have his work in our life. Maybe some of you this morning, you've never even experienced the goodness of God because you've never given your life to Jesus. I would love to pray with you this morning. I would love to introduce you to my Savior who has an amazing table set just for you. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and we're going to stand, and we're going to worship for just a minute. And this is, this is how we, we, we're going to end today, and, and we're going to sing this out. And, and, but if you want, maybe you just want to come down this morning and kneel down here and just thank God and celebrate the goodness of God. Maybe you're right there where you're at. You want to just sit down with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, and just thank God for his goodness, even if you're in the valley. Maybe this morning you've never even experienced the goodness of God. Man, don't leave here today without coming to the table. God, we love you so much. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this great gift of salvation. This gospel that is not just for that moment of salvation, but it's for every day. It's for the sanctifying work. It's for the growing work as you grow us closer to your son. And I know, Lord, there's some people in some valleys this morning. Some are there because they put themselves there. Some are there because they have no control over it. But God, no matter why we're there, I hope this morning that they understand your love for them and it doesn't matter that you're not done with us. That you are good and you do what is good. Help us to celebrate you this morning. God, work in our hearts and let us respond as you draw us ever more closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand this morning and worship with us?